Over the last two weekends, I had the privilege of representing my country in the online Olympiad. We did fairly well. We started in the fourth division. We managed to place third in our group and qualify to the, the next division, Division 3. Uh, well, unfortunately, we were quite soundly outmatched and uh, we crashed out there. But uh, I played a, a, a number of good games. But in particular, one of them was picked up by the team that was doing official commentary by, by church.com. In particular, Jen really liked what I did in this game. And so I thought I'd show you some clips from the official commentary. And then afterwards, I'll take you through the game myself. Let's get into the action as it looks like we've got, a, what is this opening? It looks like a yeah. Sicilian with a, oh, this is an odd combination of moves for white guys. Like if you don't want to play the main line of the Sicilian, that's fine. There's so many good ways to play against the Sicilian, but I'm not a big fan of this knight in front of the F pawn because uh, ah, it, it, okay. yeah. if you're going to play these closest systems, usually I want to get my pawn out with F4. Mm hmm. Yeah, uh, this is actually this is called the King's Indian uh, um, attack variation, I think, against the Sicilian. So White is going for a King's Indian setup. And if I'm not mistaken, it was actually Sergei Karyakin who played such a system against um, uh, Sam Shankland uh, and defeated Sam Shankland to come back into the World Cup. Ah, uh, yes, that, those games Doesn't were it. so good. I didn't realize it came from this exact line. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a very dangerous line where, uh, yeah, but I like black setup here. Black chose not to allow, uh, went for a very solid setup with my GE7 and E5 because D3 is a very passive move, at least for the moment. You can now take more control in the center by putting your pawn on E5. And also so, you're yeah. trying to play for F5, whereas white can't play F4 right away. They might be able to later, but you could play F5, especially... You know, depending that queen on e2 could end up somewhat misplaced in certain lines. So I, I like the way black's playing. I still like this position for black. h6 was played, trying to stop knight g5 and also maybe tuck the king in on h7. Um, mm -hmm. White plays h3. Um, you know, h3 doesn't make as much sense to me as h6. Yeah, I agree there. Yeah, h6 has a clear purpose, which means that if the bishop comes to e6, white does not have knight g5. <laughs> h3 well black wasn't going to put the bishop on g4 anyway i would say because uh, off, if you play bishop g4 and then white plays h3 you don't really want to take on f3 right exactly you don't want to give up that bishop not not at this stage because it would also allow white to coordinate their pieces quite beautifully the knight on d2 would capture the bishop on c1 would get out the rooks would say hello to each other so yeah i, I love the way black is playing this though um, after the h6 move playing f5 very aggressive now there's a big question though how yeah, do you maybe. take back on f5 there's so many options which one do you like the best actually can you rank them in order of oh. favorite <laughs> favorite through least favorite yeah the ranking oh i like that uh, let's see uh so okay we've got four up no can i count one two three four yeah four you got options. four right yeah, so g take I like the best. Uh, let's stick to this position for one second. So uh, the player decided to play bishop takes f5. Um, I think I would take with the pawn next with the knight and then the bishop and the rook. The rook I like the least because white can play knight h4 ideas perhaps. Bishop takes at least develops a piece. Knight takes, I think the knight looks kind of good on f5. And the bishop wants to go to e6. But I think overwhelmingly the best would be G takes because then you've got more control over the center. You can, um, yeah, if white plays knight h4, the pawn is very nicely protected instead of on g6, where it's only protected by that knight. So I would say G takes. How about you, Jennifer? Um, gosh, you did convince me. Although I also like the idea of the F file um, and taking with a knight. And um, just to, because we do have that, we do have that nice pressure along the F file. You created that, that little weakness with H3 as well. So I can totally see why Black has been wanting to open the F file. So it mm -hmm. kind of continues on that vibe. But I also feel like it's really instructive what you're saying that you can kind of change your plan and keep that beautiful center and open up the G file instead. Um, but let's see what happened after Bishop F5, Knight H4, Bishop E6. Yeah, um, I feel like I, I still like black at the moment. 
Yeah, Black has got a lot of good things going uh, for uh, for him, which is, of course, the, the center. You've got more control over the center. You've got a half open file, which might be useful. The knight can be kicked away with g5. Uh, the one thing white has is the less space. If you have less space, you want to trade off as many minor pieces as you can, but all the minor pieces are still on the board. So that's why black, in my opinion, has a, has a significant advantage here. King h2, and also one more thing is that with the e4 pawn gone, black can start thinking about even pushing further. Now look at this great play by black though. Um, I like these, the fact that every single piece in black's army is doing something. I mean, these rooks are doubled, there's pressure on h3. Um, the knight and the bishop are defending <laughs> e5. It's a really lovely position for black. I have fun with the colors. I like <laughs> every piece is green, you know. There are no red pieces for black. Like I'm loving it. Okay, yeah, but for white, uh, once again, it's the space advantage, yeah? uh, like the space disadvantage, actually. White has trouble finding good squares for the, the pieces at the This one looks funny. We've this was actually the game where. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had uh, the Karyakin variation of uh, comparison, the Karyakin Sam Shankland uh, comparison. And we said Black was playing fantastic. And it looks like they've continued mm -hmm. that trend. As before, we said that Black's pieces were all looking um, fantastic. And now mm -hmm. they're actually up in exchange and mm -hmm. they're up, uh, you know, position, in position as well because the queen on h5 is now facing um, a g takes f4. And look at this, the move yeah. bishop e4. Um, let's see the tactics here. Uh, always looking to see if something like pawn takes f4 works. Um, but. Well, it works. And then pawn takes. Well, whoa. You can't, the idea here is that. Yeah, the, the idea is this probably. Yeah, and then. Exactly. The, the attacked on f1. But there is king g2, right? Or king g1. So, I mean, after pawn takes f4, you don't have to take it. Mm -hmm. Or you could take but it with the queen. After this, you actually are going to mate. So maybe you have to take with the queen on g3 instead? I mean, I'm sure it all then, loses. But, but then you lose the full rook. Like, we, yeah. uh, in this position, f takes g3, the rook is hanging on f1. So you do need to play something like king g2. Yeah. But then after taking and queen takes a treat, it's actually over. I was thinking then it's important where you put the queen, but I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out maybe queen h4 is the best move then. Because after f takes king g2, you don't have rook takes and queen takes a three. But here you, you have queen d5 check. Yeah. And then there's knight f3. But this looks horrible. It does the look bishop horrible. gets to this uh, to this file diagonal. It should be more or less equivalent. I would, totally I would take this position even with two pawns less on the board with black because the bishop. Or you could play just bishop b five. I mean, you could play b six or you could play bishop b five. They both kind of have that same I idea. This one, yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah, you can play a lot of moves here. I mean, you're, white yeah. is so paralyzed that you just literally make a move that doesn't attack anything that threatens to attack something. But that's too much because you know even too threatening much. the even threatening a threat is is too much if your position is that passive, right? Yeah, uh, there are yeah. so many tactics as well. Like if you if you want to take the the pawn on h six, you have rook h five, for example. Let's say I play b six here. Takes you have two ways to deal with this, and that's rook h five, I believe, double attacking the queen and the bishop. But there's also d two. Um, yeah, d2, which allows you to attack the rook on f1, which supports the knight on f3. So there's just a lot of tactics going on here. So yeah, even though you give up the exchange, you're getting a lot in return if you do so. So yeah, I totally agree. I think g takes f4 is a fantastic move. Off to bishop b4. Uh, what was played? Queen. Oh. What? After taking, taking... Okay, that was that 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 was a weird way to give an exchange back. <laughs> so, okay, Black has given up the has traded the queens, given up the rook, but is going to get the d2 bishop in the end as well. And I think Black should still be fine here, but uh, this was a bit uh, suspicious, you could say. Okay, uh, let's move on to another game. Okay, so let's go through the game. So I was playing here on the Black side. 
This was the match against Aotomi and Princip. My opponent was Mr. Espirito Santo. He's a candidate master from Sao Tome. Uh, his rating over the board is 1906 in classical. So we are fairly evenly matched in terms of rating. He started one e4. I played a Sicilian with c5. And he played d3 going for these close Sicilians. I responded knight c6. Knight f3. G6 to fianchetto my bishop on G7. He responded with G3 fianchetto in his own bishop in response. Bishop G7, bishop D2. Um, I played D6, knight Bd2 and E5. This is really the first committal decision that I make. The idea behind E5 is to, of course, make sure that uh, I get this bind on the center over the square D4. And sure that he's never going to play the typical C3, D4 break. He might, but I probably, probably have to play to the pawn sack. Um... And then once the center is locked like this, I can turn my attention fully towards the king side. So he played c3, then I played knight g to e7. Again, like I mentioned, because the center is blocked, I, I want to attack on the on the king side, basically with a move f5. And so I prefer my knight <coughs> to be on e7, not being in front of the, the f1. Uh, he played queen e2, castles, castles. And then I started h6. Whenever I want to go f5, I want to watch out for moves like knight g5 into e6. That can tend to be annoying. So it's a good idea to just start with h6. To just take all these g5 ideas out, out, of, the, out of the game. His bishop could also come to g5 in some lines. He also played h3. Telegraphing that he perhaps wants to go with a similar plan. But then his knight is in front of his f1. Which is the key difference between our, our two positions. So I achieve f5 first. I played it immediately. He took back. Um... Yeah, here is typically standard to take back with the pawn. Could also take with the knight. And um, I decided to take with the bishop. Um, it's the piece that I haven't yet developed for one thing. And I, I wanted to keep the file open. Particularly because he put his knight in front of the pawn. There could be some, some ideas, some tactics uh, that could that could occur over there. He played knight h4, kicking my bishop back. I came back to, to e6. And then he, he developed the other knight to c4. I play queen d7. He played queen h2. Now he also wants to play for f4. Uh, but the problem is that the center has changed. It's no longer as blocked as it was. And in fact, I, I now dominate the center with three points to two. And I can start advancing, which I did immediately with d5. Pushing the knight back. The knight had to go elsewhere. And now that I'm winning in, in the center, um, I don't really have to crash on the king side any longer. But I, I can still put some pressure. On, on both sides of the board. So I started with rook f7. Just to double down the f file. Bishop d2. I doubled there. Uh, his knight was struggling to come back into the game. And now I'm dominating both in the center. And here on the on the king side. So the position is completely winning. Uh, already plus and minus 4 according to the engine. And it's only a question of finding a breakthrough. Um, the engine recommends g5. Which I mean of course in retrospect makes perfect sense. Kicking the knight back. And then I can play something like e4 with tempo. Um, I I went for the move e4. It's an interesting idea that exists in in many standard positions that come out of the king's Indian, usually on the other side. So if you look at the structure, it's similar to what you can get in a in a king's Indian on the white side, where you have all these central pawns and your opponent is fianchettoed. Sometimes you want to you want to advance in the in the center. That's the key, right? The move I really want to play is d4. But whenever I play d4, I give him this outpost on, on e4, right? For his bishop or his knight in some lines. So I want to play d4 without giving him that outpost. And that's where the that's where the idea comes from. So it's a pawn sacrifice. So he starts with e4. And after he takes, you force him to inhabit that outpost square that he would have gotten with the pawn. And then you go for the, the push that you want, which is d4. And now the square is no longer free for him to use. So it's a pawn sacrifice, but it, it breaks up the center, and usually when it's prepared, well, it can be very strong. So c takes, c takes was played, and here you can see that I have a lot of pressure here in the center. He played knight e1 to try and cover the square, um, but that was a bit slow. I continue with knight e5, increasing my pressure on the, on the d3 square. I still want to push. He played rook c1. So I went d3. He played queen e3, walking right into knight c4, walking queen and bishop, sorry. 
and uh, basically the queen has zero squares, right? The only square is to come here, but I will drop a whole piece. So he's forced to give up this exchange. Rook takes c4, bishop takes c4. He played b3, I play bishop a6 to maintain protection of the, the e6 pawn. Then he wanted to also now lash out with f4, but I was a bit too late. I had too, many, too much activity, too many squares. Bishop d4 came in. The queen was forced to f3. Then I made use of this pin to play the move g5, forcing his knight into f5, and then winning another pawn there on f5. We play queen h5 to try and get into my my king side i play bishop g7 just to keep everything nice and protected and play this move bishop e4 and now this is where in the commentary they, they pointed out that the move g takes f4 is completely winning and um yeah i should have seen it of course but already here i was quite low on time i was already close to getting below a minute so and he had a, a bunch a, a lot more time than i did so i was looking for a way to liquidate directly into an end game and I spotted this move queen e8. Um, and I calculated to the end, I realized that the end game is just winning at the end there. And so I just went for it without looking for anything else. When you don't have that much time, when you see one thing that works, you don't really have much time to consider anything else. Although it's it's an it's an exchange, and it's a sacrifice of an exchange. I get an end game that is completely winning. Like you saw in the in the game. Like they pointed out, of course, G takes F4 is completely winning. After he takes, I just take back with the rook. And the queen has no squares that will protect against the threat of f takes g3 with the reveal on his rook and the attack on his king. So he has to go something like queen h4, then I take on g3. The king can't take because the rook is hanging. So, and if the queen takes again, the rook hangs, he has to play king here. And then I just exchange these up and play queen f5, and the king is getting checkmated. He has no squares, and this is checkmate. So, yeah, that would have been very easily winning, and I, I really should have seen it. But anyway, I played queen e8. He exchanged and of course took what he thought was a rook. My point was I'm playing rook e2. And after king h1, I'm going to take back the, the bishop. So I give an exchange back. But the difference is that I have this powerful pawn on, on, on d3 that I'd seen beforehand that he can't forcefully take back. And once he cannot start end game, I thought I, I should always be, be winning. And I was quite correct. So knight f3, I took the pawn back on a2. And yeah, he really needed to, needed to play rook d1 immediately. Um, but of course, the, here I can't advance the pawn. So my point was that I was going to play this one and trade off the rooks and still still maintain my, my pass pawn. The bishop would maybe come back here and then I'll start pushing. So, but then he went for something else, f takes g5 and was way too slow. So already I can push d2 and the knights uh, cannot take the pawn just yet. And now whenever the rook comes, he gets hit with something like... Uh, like that, or I play bishop c6 first and then I hit him with, with that. So from here I was completely lost once again. He tried bishop e6 check, my king came my king came back. Uh, bishop c4, I just exchanged bishops and then took back. So the, the rook now came back after bishop c3, he's never winning that pawn. The king tried to come and join. And here like the engine points out, it would have been very simple to just scooch my rook over one file and just go a5, a4, a3, a2, a1, it's completely winning. Um, but uh, I had, I had, I had, I think I was less than ten seconds at this point, so every move had to come immediately. So I just went, went for the, went for the other pawn. Um, I thought if he takes, I, I can take back, and I, I have protected past pawns. That should be good enough to win, I think. Um, he played c five. I, I, I chased the pawn some more. King f two. From here, a lot of blunders were made by both sides, but uh, time trouble was the main reason why. Rook c5, the king got close enough to take the pawn, but I played rook d5 so that whenever he does take out, trade everything off and my pass pawns here will win easily. So that stopped him from taking. He played h4, I, I wanted to keep some pawns on the board. g4, the knight came to g5, and I had to bring my king in and make sure I don't fall for any kind of fox. So I just put my rook here, one diagonal away, a famous position where it's very difficult for the knight to ever attack the rook again. He tried rook h1, but by this point I was... It was quite simple. This pawn is completely stopped, cannot go for it. And I have connected passes here on the queen side. So the game ended uh, soon after. With a with a little nice touch at the end where I, I give up one pawn, but the point is that he can't take back because the other pawn goes through. So it was a, a fairly nice game. Um I played a few games that were quite nice in this tournament. I also played quite a number that were just horrible, as per usual. But yeah, in the end, I, I enjoyed the experience quite a bit. And uh, of course, it was nice getting noticed on the, on the official stream. Okay, thank you very much for tuning in. 
uh, drop a like leave a comment if you haven't subscribed enjoy chess <laughs>